All right. Nicole, hello. This is so Hi. fun. <laughs> I know. I'm I'm already so excited. We had like two and a half minutes of pre-recording chat and I'm like, okay, I like you very much. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> it's gonna be well, okay. So just for everybody who didn't hear our pre-recorded chat, we haven't met. Um, but we have some mutual friends and we kind of hang out in some of the same online or whatever, I don't know, well-being circles, whatever you want to call it, hiking, recovery. Um, yeah, all the weird things that we do. <laughs> I have to say, we'll get into some of our similarities and differences hiking wise. At some point on every hike, I kind of look around. I'm like, this is a dumb hobby. Yes. <laughs> Every time try hiking for like weeks or months at a time. And if you don't have an existential crisis, at least once I, I do, it's someone that I cannot relate to. I, I feel like I've met a couple of people who long distance hike and are just mostly blissed out about it all of the time. And I feel like I, I, I don't know. I like hate it 2% less than I love it. And that's like enough of a reason for me to keep going, but there's always times where I'm like, how did you get here? Why are these your choices? What has happened to you? Like it, yeah. So very same. So if you're watching the video of this, you could see, well, you probably already know what the nerdy thing I do with books and flag all these things. I've pulled out a few quotes where you're like very clearly, this is the dumbest hobby ever. Why am I spending my life doing this? And it comes up more than a couple of times. Um, so this is your beautiful book how to be alone. The title grabbed me as soon as I saw this was what was coming out in the world. Um, and subtitle an 800 mile hike on the Arizona trail. Can we first just talk about like, why? Hi. Yeah, we, de <laughs> we definitely can. Why long distance hiking? Why the Arizona trail? What's your question? Why? Well, not so much why Arizona, why the distance 800 miles at the time that you did it. I think that's what I'm most interested in is yeah. why then? Yeah. I feel like to answer this question, honestly, we have to do a little time traveling. I have to provide a little bit of backstory. So I got sober in 2011, a month before my 26th birthday and a really unlikely decision that I made the day that wound up being my last day of drinking was that I was going to start running. And I never played sports growing up. I was not the kid in like the peewee soccer or whatever. I was not, let's go play games outside. I was, let's stay inside and read books and like eat candy and like go to a museum or something. Right. So I had never really run before and I tried it and I couldn't make it a full two minutes of jogging. And I said, you know, I'm going to run a half marathon. I'm a train for a half marathon. That's, that's how I'm going to get myself out of this drinking hole, which looking back now, I'm like, where did that idea come from? And also thank goodness that I had that idea because it really was incredibly helpful for me. Um, it was sort of a, I don't want to say like transfer of obsession. I don't know if that's the right word, but I have a really hard time removing something from my life, especially something that had been such a huge part of my coping, my life as drinking was without having something else to replace it with. And running really was that for me. It was the way out of the hole and not the only way, but it was definitely the, like the predominant way that I got sober at the beginning. And I loved running for four years. I wasn't running well, whatever that means, right? I was like a middle of the pack athlete at best, but I was really serious about it. I cared about it. It was the thing that I had the 20 different tabs open, you know, reading about how many memoirs can I read by people who run? I was really, I was really obsessed with it. And that was true until it wasn't. And what happened for me, um, it was about four years into running and physically I was as fit as I had ever been. There was nothing that was wrong. I was training for what was supposed to be my first ultra marathon and I was so miserable. Yeah. And I remember there was one training run in particular and it was, it was a long run. So I was at least in, it was an out and back. So I was at least an hour, hour and a half away from my car. And I just stopped on the side of the trail and I started crying. And I had this realization that if I couldn't post a picture from the finish line of that race on social media, that I wouldn't be doing it. I was like, that, okay, that's interesting. And so I walked the entire way that, and I had run out. So it took me quite a long time to get back to my car. And I realized that 
I was afraid that if I stopped running, I would start drinking again. Yeah. And it felt like that wasn't the right reason to keep running. It felt like a really fear. It had been supportive and then had to become more fear-based. And I realized, ah, there's probably more to sobriety than just running a lot, right? There's probably some deeper work that I need to do and some questions I need to ask. And obviously I'm joking about it a little and making light of it, but I felt really afraid. It felt like, am I one injury away from having everything, you know, crumble down and So I decided to take what I thought was going to be a couple of weeks off of running. This was in 2015. LOL, I have not run since, really. Um, So I took the break I thought was going to be a break from running, wound up being mostly I just stopped running and did a lot of that deeper work, right? That was therapy. That was, you know, a, a lot of other things that go into that kind of healing. And that was great. That was the right decision. I'm really glad for it. And I found that even doing that deeper work, there was something really tangible that I missed about running. Running had been the first thing that was a really embodied practice, right? I wasn't into yoga. I what like, it was really the first time that I'm like, oh, I don't just exist from the neck up. That's interesting. And so I missed that. I missed the embodied aspect. I missed the fact that running was so black and white. Like you either completed the miles or you didn't, you ran the time in the race or you didn't like it it was so much more clear than a lot of the rest of my life, which felt pretty messy. And I missed that. And I missed just the challenge of it. And so this was, you know, kind of fast forward, this was winter of 2015 going into 2016. And I was just hungry for something else to take the place of what running had been for me. And hopefully from a way that wasn't, oh, my entire mental well-being is, is hinged on this thing working out. And I found out about long distance hiking really. And I, I had kind of heard that, you know, the Appalachian trail was a thing that existed and people do, but it was always just, I had never gone camping a night in my life. Right. I'm like, I'm not a six foot white bearded dude in flannel. Like this is not for me. It was just something, one of those things that is just like raises over you. You never internalize that it's a thing people do. And what happened was I read a book, uh, it, I, you know, the Amazon Kindle, if you liked this book, you'll probably like this book was recommended to me by my now friend, Carrot Quinn called through hiking will break your heart. Mm. And it was, a, it was a story of someone who also didn't grow up outdoorsy and got into long distance hiking in their early thirties, which I was at that time and went out there and did this and didn't die. And I was like, huh, maybe I also could try this and not die. And it was just, it seemed as far fetched to me as running had at the beginning. And it was the feeling of like, oh my gosh, I have 25 tabs open again. I'm really into the idea of this. And it was more I don't even know that I was interested in long distance hiking. I was interested in who I would have to become in order to even start. Yes. That I'm always less interested in the goal itself than whatever the process is of becoming the person that I need to be to give it a shot, like to not, cause I couldn't have walked out that day. I didn't own a single camping gear. I had no idea any of it. And I was, I was just interested in what could happen. And I had recently moved to Oregon. Uh, I was married at the time. So with my then husband and that was the most outdoorsy place I'd ever lived. I grew up in Manhattan and in London and, you know, lived in LA and San Francisco and always really big cities. And here I was living in central Oregon and I had been on a couple of day hikes and I was like, okay, okay. I I can see why somebody would like being amongst the trees. Uh, So that was how long distance hiking kind of came into my life to begin with. I love it. Okay. You hit on a few things that I talk about a lot and I love when we can have another writer or teacher or somebody say the same things that I say, because I think we need to hear the things that we need to hear over and over again in so many different ways, right? One is that you found it more helpful to crowd out drinking than to quit drinking. We can't quit things, right? It's like it nature abhors a vacuum and we create vacuums when we try to quit activities, habits, thoughts, feelings, people, jobs, like our brain is automatically like, well, now what? Now what I need to reach for something. So I work with a lot of people who they're trying to quit drinking. They're trying to quit maybe a relationship, maybe a job. A lot of us are trying to quit something like anxiety, right? Having our our teeth so into overwhelm, worry, self-doubt, um, anxiety, stress, just all of this negative, this spin cycle. Like we're, it's like we're, <laughs> broken washing machines. It's like, we just keep, can we rinse and be done with that load? And we just keep spinning on it. It's much easier 
it's much more natural to crowd things out. And I also love what you said. You ran until that wasn't working anymore. And then you moved on, right? We don't have to go somewhere permanently. We don't have to commit forever. Do it till it doesn't work anymore. When I quit drinking, I ate ice cream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That it's, for a year. And I also think there's something interesting about talking about really big life changes in retrospect, because yeah. it's, you know, I'm always careful. It sounds simple when you're telling what's essentially like a multi-year story in a minute and a half, right. That it wasn't just like, oh, and now I'm going to run as I'm sure for you, it wasn't just like, and now there's ice cream, right. That, and right. even you know, stopping running was the same thing. It was really fraught. I had made, I had inadvertently made running my identity and right. the way that I had made drinking my identity in a certain way. Right. So the, the untangling from that was really complex. And also it was absolutely the training wheels that I needed. And, you know, we need different things at different times. Something that feels really supportive in one season of life no longer serves us. And I feel like, I think a lot about sort of what I see as this cultural like fetish of longevity that's like you start doing something and then you have to do it forever it's like eh, but why right I don't I don't want to anymore and that's a good enough reason to not yes yes giving yourself the permission even for that which again sounds simple when we're sitting here kind of talking about it but to live it is fraught is a great word for that um you also said um something about the embodiment of something like running some for sure, something like through hiking, right? How I think the poet Maggie Smith talks about using our bodies as plant stands for our heads, which I love the, the imagery of that because we do, right? We live from the neck up. We're very heady. We glorify thinking. We're taking notes obsessively. We're consuming knowledge and information and headlines and right but to get into our body and to use that as more than just a vehicle for our heads to travel around and to live in your body, which, okay, we're going to do something. Hopefully you like this. <laughs> I'm going to read you to you. Oh gosh. Okay. Different ways. <laughs> but one of the first quotes that I flagged in here, um, speaks to exactly this. You said, this is, this is, I think day. Yeah, we're, we're day three, okay? And you say, this is one of the best things about long distance hiking, I realize. The ease and simplicity of recognizing your body's basic needs and the joy you feel as you are able to meet each one. Mm -hmm. Nothing else is going on out on the trail, really. Right? There's no, yeah. there's very little drama. You don't, and you were hiking solo. So you didn't have anybody even in your ear chirping at you about what they were thinking or feeling. It was one step in front of the other. Here's what's happening. Here's what's coming up. Hunger, thirst, pain, fatigue, right? Whatever it was. So speak to that a little bit of what, and again, I know as somebody who's, who's done some intense hikes, but different hikes, which we will talk about this. It is an interesting thing to kind of talk about it retrospectively. When you're in it, it feels so, all, it is all all consuming. <laughs> Which is what I like about it, honestly, yeah. that I, something that I, I feel like I'm still on a quest of trying to unlearn this is I'll be sitting at my computer working or writing or doing whatever. And I'm aware of the fact that I have to pee. And I'm like, well, let me just answer one more email. Yes. Let me just finish one more. It's like, go pee, like just, <laughs> just go do it. And for whatever reason, whether it's the absence of distractions, the fact that I'm not as neck up when I'm on trail, those needs feel really clear and they also feel really easy to meet that, okay, I'm really thirsty. I'm going to drink some water. I'm hungry. I'm going to stop and have a snack. My foot hurts. Let me take my shoe off and see what's going on with that. Like, and I think because the fact that essentially all I'm doing is walking all day, that if I don't meet the body's needs, the consequences for doing that are a lot more severe than they are when I'm off trail, or at least they're a lot more urgent and real time, right? That's and what I was so say they're more immediate. Right. That if, if there is a little pebble in my shoe and I'm just like, nah, let me go one more mile. Let me go one more mile. 
Mm, okay. Well then what happens when my skin rips open or I have, you know, it's some kind of blister that then bothers me for weeks that it's almost like I give myself permission to meet my body's needs when I'm doing something that's so physical because I feel like I've earned it or just if I can justify it. There's something in that, that I often wish that what I learn on long hikes came home with me better. Some of it does. And I think, but I think this is why I'm now over 5,000 miles into long distance hiking. Like this is why I keep going out there because there's always something that I forget about when I come home. Right. Or that I'm so grateful for, you know, being able to open the fridge and get a snack or being able to lay on a bed when I first get home. And then eventually I take that for granted again. So I think the, the, that physicality My, I guess it's best said this way. Perhaps my favorite thing about long distance hiking is that it's not easy, but it is simple. That like walk from point A to point B, don't die. That's the goal. And, you know, that's said a little flippantly, but there actually aren't that many things you need to do in order to meet that. You have to eat, you have to rest, you have to drink water, you have to stretch and take care of your body. And obviously injuries and problems can come up that no matter how well you take care of yourself, things happen outside of our control. But it's, it is the simplest that my life ever feels. There is nothing else. Nobody needs anything from me, which to be honest is like an emotional rush that I love. I can tell I'm at the time, I don't know when this is going up, but at the time that we're recording this, I'm about a week away from leaving for my next hike. And I can tell that it's time for me to go on a hike when I'm start to be like, oh my God, I just want to put my phone in airplane mode. I want nobody to need anything from me ever. And like, I get really dramatic and resentful. I'm like, "Mm, okay, maybe go to the woods for a while. (laughs) It's such a fascinating microcosm of life right? The proverbial pebble in our shoe that you're right in everyday life, when you're at home with your modern day luxuries and just whatever that we can kind of ignore for, I mean, for, for, for sure days and weeks, in some cases, months, years, decades, right? I see this a lot with, I mean, with drinking, with emotions, with relationships, and it's just like, well, we'll see. Well, like how bad can the next, and I mean, on the hike, it's like, how bad can the next half a mile be with this pebble Mm -hmm. in life? It's like, well, how bad can the next year be with this partner, this job, right? This, well, I mean, the consequences are coming, right? And I think there's such a, it's such a counterintuitive and you're right. There's a simplicity to it with something when you're on the trail, really, there's no other distractions versus when we're in our lives it's like we have this this it seems counterintuitive to stop and look at it and take Mm -hmm. care of it right and on the trail it's almost like you're gonna have to stop and look at this and take care of this and I, I think that some of it is that uh hiking that much is at least for me inherently uncomfortable, like it, which doesn't mean that it isn't fun at times and joyful. And, you know, there's all kinds of reasons to be out there, but physically, I feel like I'm always sort of uncomfortable, right? It's like trading one discomfort for another. It's like, well, yeah, I do want to sit here and rest longer, but then I'm going to run out of water. I, you know, or then I'm going to get to camp after dark, or it's kind of like a trade-off of discomforts. And when I'm in that place, for whatever reason, I find it easier to be like, well, I'm already low-key uncomfortable. Why would I not do everything I can to be as comfortable as possible in my discomfort, which taking the pebble out of the shoe does. It's like, I I have this very clear memory of a hike from 2018 where I think just because of how much I was sweating and salt crystals, I got terrible butt chafe. I don't know if you ever had butt chafe, but it was, it was so painful, but it started out as just this little, oh, that feels a little not great. And I was like, I should probably stop and like extra clean it and wet wipe it and put something on. And I didn't. And it erupted into this like flaming, painful situation that I do not wish on anyone. And I think about that now all the time where I'm like, is this going to be the next flaming butt shape? Like maybe just deal with it before your ass is on fire. So maybe just deal with it. Right. <laughs> right. And there are so many of us who are unwilling, again, it's just a microcosm of life. We're unwilling to look at it until it does become <laughs> this flaming, like just skin on fire free fall of hell in whatever that is in life. And you know, that that's something outside of hiking, even that I I think about a lot. And I feel like one of my 
I don't know, like life principles or something that I really try to remember for myself is this idea that I don't have to wait until I'm so miserable in order to change something. Like, so I got divorced in early 2019 and, you know, it was arguably the best divorce of all time that, you know, we wanted to transition to a friendship. We were on the same page at the same time. It was still so sad and a lot of grief and really hard and a lot of logistical things. But as far as divorces go, it was certainly not that bad. And part of what made that possible was almost getting divorced too soon in some ways that like, we didn't stick it out right in air quotes that we were both like, okay, the stories we had always been told about who gets divorced or why that happens is because you're so miserable or you hate each other so much, or someone has done something so terrible to the other person. And sure, those can be reasons, but we were like, if we have to hate each other in order to make a change, we'll get there eventually. But why, why not do this now when we can still be friends? When last year I was excited to go to his wedding. And obviously that was just what happened for me. It's, we were lucky that we were on the same page at the same time, but I think there's like something, there's an inherent principle in that, that I try to think of, of there's no like gold star for she who survives the thing the longest or who like waits until they're the most miserable possible. Or if there is, I'm not interested in earning that gold star. Yes. Right. And I think it's such a, this is my audience has heard me say it this way of like, you don't have to hate something to quit it. You don't have to hate your partner to leave. You don't have to hate your job to move on to something else. You don't have to hate something about yourself in order to create change. Right. And like you said, it's one way to live. That's one way to go about it. And I guess if you're handed something, it can be a powerful catalyst for sure, but it's not required, Mm -hmm. right? And so discomfort, (laughs) I talk a lot about discomfort with my people. We're dealing with anxiety. I'm a meditation teacher, which is an inherently, albeit very safe, it's extremely uncomfortable right? For us to sit still and for us to just deal with whatever comes up mentally, emotionally, physically, as we're sitting. And there were a couple of times in the book that you talk obviously about discomfort because it's highly uncomfortable. You said, okay, let's see what day we're on here. So spoiler alert, it's a 44 day hike, right? So, and she has this separated out. It's not in chapters, it's by day. And so taking us through through the 800 miles from the Arizona, Utah border to Mexico, (laughs) right? It's exquisite. It was fantastic. I read it in like three days. Um, Okay. So this is day, what did I just say? 17. Um, Through hiking is nothing more than day after day of selecting between varying levels of discomfort, I've realized. And yet I think I love it. (laughs) I mean, I hate it too. I really hate it, but it's a loving hate, mostly. I'm still out here, aren't I? And you can, I, like, I can feel the inner dialogue with you. <laughs> like, I can just imagine you kind of reasoning with yourself as you're out there. And I, again, it's such a microcosm of life. That's all we're doing is dealing with varying levels of discomfort, right? We have to pay taxes and go to the DMV. And then we have to like, wake up early to take somebody to the doctor and somebody's going to call with bad news and make a favor, whatever. And Then every once in a while, just like on the trail, when like, like when you get up before the sunrise and then you like come up over a peak and it's like, whoa, there's this moment. And then you're like, okay, now it's just kind of back to sucking. Now the sun's up and it's freaking Mm -hmm. (laughs) hot. It's varying levels of discomfort. And the goal isn't necessarily seeking comfort, right? It's not always like, how can I get back to good? Otherwise you would never go hike anyway. It's not inherently comfortable, but there's something about being with a certain level of discomfort and finding an okayness there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Years ago, my friend, Lauren Fleshman said something to me that I think about all the time and reference all of the time. Uh, She said it in the context of running, but it applies here to this idea that it's a privilege to be able to choose your suffering. Oh, And I I think that that is also a really important, almost like umbrella to put over conversations like this, because there's a huge difference from the suffering that we choose for ourselves and the suffering that we do not choose, Mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, uh, something with our bodies, something systemically oppressive, you know, there's so many different kinds of suffering that we don't choose. And I think it's like a, 
a tough needle to thread in talking about like ultra endurance events, I think is that there can be a lot of glorification of suffering in the, in that community or in that space, or at least that I've seen that I'm really not interested in. And I have felt myself default into that sometimes of like, I'm so hardcore. I can suffer so much. It's like, sure. And at any time, if I truly didn't want to be doing that anymore, I could go home. I have a home to go home to. I have people who would, you know, give me money to get off trail if that's what I needed, all of these things. And so it's like, to your point, I think that there's a lot that we learn when most of our life is comfortable to some degree. Mm -hmm that there's an aliveness that's lost if everything is comfort. And I think that's part of what I'm seeking by doing adventures like this, but there's really a difference in knowing that I could always stop. Yes. Yes. And it is, it's an interesting, you're right to zoom out on this. There is a certain, well, not a certain kind. There's a very obvious kind of privilege when we can take ourselves out into the woods and do something kind of weird and strenuous. And then to your point, you could bail at any time and you'd have half a dozen people easy who would come get you, who would phone in favors, food, beds, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It is a certain kind of privilege and it's um, recognizing where we are on that spectrum and right-sizing that, right? Because the certain level of discomfort and suffering that there is just in being alive and being human, no matter what that level of privilege or not is, is one thing. And then, like I said, right-sizing that, keeping some perspective on where we are there. Yeah. And, you know, I get feedback from people sometimes. It's like, oh my God, why would you ever want to do this? I would never want to do this. I'm like, that's fair right? There's nothing morally better about wanting this to be your hobby. There's plenty of great hobbies out there. This just happens to be mine. This happens to be the one that I'm currently really into and have been for years. And that's, that's what it is. It's a hobby, right? And I feel like I've learned so many life lessons through it. And I've built my life around it to some degree that I don't have kids and I'm self-employed. And those two things allow me more time freedom to be able to do this. And that's not, that wasn't by accident. That's really, this is what I want. I want to be able to go for four to six weeks at a time, multiple times a year and do this for as long as I'm able or as long as I want to. And some of the conversations I have with people that it almost feels like they're bringing some kind of shame to the conversation of, what I would never want to do, you know, like what's wrong with me that I'm not that tough or whatever. I'm like, this isn't an indication of toughness, or at least it's one kind of toughness. And it's totally fine if this isn't what you want to do with your one precious life. A hundred percent, a hundred, given all the time and resources and comforts in the world, I would never scrapbook ever. Like there's hobbies. I would just, I get it. I'm like, I'm never going to do it. Right. That said, I think there's something kind of primal about hiking, right? There's just something, first of all, you're outside, which we need more than (laughs) more and more and more and more. The more inside we get, the more technological we get, the more tied we get to all the things, devices, screens, right? And, And disconnected from life, right? I think there is something very, very primal about nature. So I will admit, to being a little snotty about anything that gets people outside. You don't have to do like crazy hikes or anything, but if you're outside, I do think you're, you're onto something, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. There was another quote. Actually, this is actually, I think just on the next page. Yeah. So, and you just mentioned this quote, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life, which is Mary Oliver. And then you say, is this what I'm doing with mine? Hiking through the wilderness, thirsting alone for days and weeks? I guess so. But even though I'm often miserable doing this, even though each day seems to bring me to a new edge of discomfort, I feel alive. I've never felt more alive than this. And maybe that's enough of a reason to keep doing it. I often wish I wasn't like this, though. I love this. That I wanted an easier path. That I could just be happy at home like everyone else seems to be. (laughs) Right? It is, and this is what we joked about at the very beginning of like, at some point, and I, I do, I do intense day hikes. So 
and I tend to do things like 14ers in Colorado where there's a whole bunch of people. And at some point we all look around and we're like, this was a dumb idea, right? Why are we not sitting on the couch watching Netflix? Because that's lovely. <laughs> it's never seemed more lovely than right now. But you make the point, I feel alive. Yeah. Yeah. That's the and, why. And, you know, I think it's interesting. Obviously I've had a bunch of conversations about the book and the, the why question comes up a lot. And I feel like I'm supposed to have some kind of really profound answer. And <laughs> I honestly feel like the why is because I want to do it more than I don't want to do it. And that is reason enough for me. And I think with each different hike, maybe there's a different intention. There's something else that I'm seeking. If I were to go back and catalog all, you know, the different long distance treks that I've done, I think I was seeking something slightly different with each one, you know, the, mm -hmm. the motivation changes or where I'm at in my life at that time, you know, that, that the very first question you asked of why this hike at that time. And for me, it was a period in which I noticed myself being more of a people pleaser than I had ever been before. And I, which I don't really know where that came from. I wasn't like that as much when I was younger. And it was almost like I woke up to the fact that that's how I was being. And I was so concerned with what other people thought. I was so concerned with what other people thought that I should do with my life. And as a really new hiker, I knew that if I went with somebody else on a backpacking trip that I would give all of my power away to them. Like whatever they thought we should do is what we would do. And which doesn't mean, you know, so this, the Arizona trail, I was still quite a beginner, but it was my second hike. I did a, a section of the, of the PCT the year before I did this. And, you know, I learned as much as I reasonably could. I did research on what the conditions were be. I had someone who was kind of a hiking mentor. I don't think that it's, you know, the leap in the net will appear. I don't think is a great, I great philosophy for going into the back country. And I think that there's such a thing as too much research, right? There's like a balance there. And so I felt like I knew most of what I thought I needed to know. Right. And Yet with this hike, I think what I was looking for was almost being forced into self-reliance, which is funny because now I feel like part of what my internal work is in my life is almost the opposite of more, like if I look at my values around, you know, not the hyper-individualism, not the pull yourself up by your bootstrap bullshit that I don't believe in. Right. And like a lot of the kind of American dream culture that I'm much more interested in interdependence and community care and all of that. And two truths can exist at once, right? That those are my values. And also it felt bad to always be relying on other people to tell me how to be. And so I knew that if I started long distance hiking with someone else, that I would just default to them way too much. And also I didn't know anyone in my real life who had the desire or the time privilege to be able to do it. And so it's almost like I was, I had to go alone for those reasons. And I'm really glad that I did. And I have done my now partner. We met, you know, on a long distance hike. We met on the PCT. I've done hikes with him. I've done hikes with friends. So I've done more social hikes, but there's something that I love now about solo hiking. Okay. The people pleasing thing is fascinating to me. Um, I think we're all on a, some spectrum of people pleasing tendencies, right? I think there's a lot of it that's just in cultural conditioning. A lot of it that's in I mean, particularly, I think for those of us who identify as women, um, I, there's just a lot baked into our world around people pleasing and we get it right. I mean, to some extent, it's like, if you look at it, a group of kids in a classroom, it's easier if kids just basically do what they're supposed to do and cooperate, which is why we get some of this messaging from a very young age. Although it's curious that you can look back and see this wasn't always the way for me right? That this became more of the way for me. Yeah. And you have this moment. <laughs> what day are we on now? And I'm going back day 15 of, um, this was, I think one of the only times that you were within earshot of anybody overnight, right? <laughs> you're really reckoning with these people pleasing tendencies of yourself while you're trying to sleep <laughs> and you say, Ugh, <laughs> why am I like this? Why am I always so concerned with trying to anticipate other people's needs, making sure everyone else is as comfortable as possible to the point where I will lie 
awake in a cramped position for hours, afraid that the noise of me moving might disturb this man that I don't even really know. What the fuck, Nicole? Roll over if you need to roll over. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> So the Arizona Trail, so I did this hike in 2017. The Arizona Trail has gotten a lot more popular in the years since then. I think long distance hiking in general has gotten more popular. I was just say that. Um, so both, right? And with the AZT, most, the majority of the people who do this hike go northbound in the spring because there's more water. So I went southbound in the fall and there was nobody out there. I met three other through hikers, people who were attempting to hike the whole trail and we would overlap for like a day. Right. And yeah. I would often go two, three, four days with seeing no other humans, which maybe doesn't sound like a long time. But like I said, I grew up in Manhattan and London, like it, I'm an extrovert. It was wild. I felt like the zombie apocalypse has happened. I'm the only one left, which is great for the people pleasing because there's nobody out there. And yeah. this experience, you know, that you just recounted, I had met this dude who was out there who wound up quitting really shortly after. So he was like, I'm not having any fun. I'm like, no, that's fair. Um, and we camped together for one night, right? So our tents were pitched relatively close and I have an inflatable sleeping pad, right? That you blow up in your tent at night and you sleep on and it's great. And it's so crinkly. Like it sounds like you're sleeping on a bunch of potato chip bags. It's so crinkly. And I'm a thrasher, especially when I'm trying to get comfortable. I'm just like moving all over the place. And because I had been alone every single night, I wasn't really conscious of the noise that I was making. And here I am like, oh no, if I move too much, this man who I don't know and don't even really like, he's maybe going to be disturbed. Meanwhile, he's making all kinds of noise, right? And so, yeah, it was just like an interesting moment for me to be like, huh, yes. how come you can take care of your needs and give yourself what you need and take up space until that might infringe on someone else? And this could be a much larger conversation about, right, you said like the gender implications, any of the culture implications. And I don't think taking other people's needs into account is a problem, right? Like we exist somewhere in the middle of this. It's not a binary, only look out for yourself or be such a people pleaser that you never meet any of your own needs. Like neither of those work, but oh yeah, that it was with a couple of times that then I would be interacting with other people just to be confronted with the fact that I all of a sudden cared so much about what this dude who I'm never going to see again, right? It's not like I'm throwing rocks at his tent. I'm not like maliciously doing something to him in the night. I literally just wanted to roll over. Did I roll over? No, I like stayed in this horrible position and laid awake for hours like an asshole. Ugh. I just thought it was such a relatable moment of like, here you are, sleep is precious. You're just trying to get as comfortable as one can get. And in your mind, you're running the script of, but what about that guy? What does he need? What if I disturb him? Over just fucking flipping over. It's bananas. And like I said, I think it's one of the most relatable parts of the book because <laughs> we all do this all day, every day. It's like, well, if I move a little bit to the left, like, are you still okay? What, what are you going to think? What it, and it's the who I'll tell you, this is, I mean, there's many reasons, but this is one of the reasons that my partner and I don't share a bed. We have separate bedrooms and it's the best thing that's ever happened. It is so good that I'm just, I'm just going to starfish in the night. I don't, there's no one here. It's amazing. So yes, that's, that was, that was my takeaway. <laughs> talk about, I mean, think about all of the, we could talk for hours about all of this, like, but here's what you're supposed to do, Nicole, right? There's no romance in that. And like, do you guys not like each other? And why, mm -hmm. like, don't you think you'll just get used to it? all of the things that we think we're supposed to and expected to do? And this is how it's supposed to look. And there might, is there something wrong with us? All of this questioning that we literally, it's like swimming upstream. We have to overcome in order to be who we want to be in the world, which is bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. It's realizing how many things are optional or are scripts that I, I had lived with multiple partners before this and had always shared beds and shared bedrooms and never thought about it as some, as a choice that I could make for a lot of the reasons yes. that you said, right. Your relationships in trouble, if that's the case. And what happened was, so, um, when my former spouse and I decided to get divorced, we were still going to be living together for five or six months after that. And we decided that it would be a good idea for me to move into the guest room in order just to put some kind of like more tangible space and boundaries around this decision. And so I moved into the guest room and like two days later, we were both like, 
what have we been doing? We were both sleeping so much better. And now it's so funny that, and obviously being able to have a separate bedroom requires like the space privilege in your house to be able to do that. Um, but now my partner and I have separate bedrooms and my former spouse and his wife now have separate bedrooms that we're all just like team separate bedrooms. It's the best. (laughs) It's so fantastic. It's so good. Um, okay. What was the other one I was going to read here? Oh, Okay. I loved this. I was just listening. Okay. Julia Louise Dreyfus just came out with a podcast called wiser than me, where she's talking to older women, Isabella Linde, Jane Fonda. Right. And, and for a whole bunch of reasons. And she tells this really poignant story in the intro about she had, and this was something she was kind of recounting how she got through her breast cancer um, diagnosis and all the treatment and everything for that. She was recounting a story where, um, her and her husband were in the ocean. They're on a boat. She was in the water. Her husband was on the boat and he yells down and he's like, Julia, don't panic. There's a shark in the water. It's like, okay, now we're really like in a life or death situation. This is like decades ago. And she said, she saw the ladder of the boat And she said, it was just all I could think was swim, like the ladder, the ladder, the ladder, the ladder. Like that was all, if I started thinking about what could happen and right, you're just going to lose the plot and freak out. And then, so I had just heard that podcast that I was reading this and I was like, oh my gosh, it's the ladder. So you are, let me see. I want to orient us here again, day 21 now. Okay. So you're about halfway through and you said, you're kind of, you're kind of having a moment. <laughs> it's hot. It's, the entire book is having a moment. It was funny. I, <laughs> I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. I have heard from people who were like, oh my God, I loved reading this. I was thinking about hiking the Arizona trail, but now I'm thinking maybe not. I'm like, listen, I was such a beginning hiker. If I were to go hike it again now, I think it would be different. I promise you probably won't cry every single day. I'm like, it doesn't have to be that miserable for you anyway. Yes. So the whole thing was having a moment. <laughs> but it's hot. You're thirsty. Right. And you're, you're kind of trying to talk yourself down. And so you're saying, no, I cannot fall apart yet. I cannot fall apart yet. Hold it in. I tell myself, you need to get to the top of this climb. Just breathe, hold it in. So I do, I shove my feelings down. I lock them up staring at the next tree and telling myself that all I need to do is hike there. Just go from tree to tree. I whisper, you can make it from tree to tree. We aren't presented with challenges that are harder than we can handle. And this is yet again, I mean, this is why I think that something, there's something about hiking and using it as a, this is what life is. Can we just get from tree to tree, right? Can we just get from like, when I wake up to bedtime, (laughs) can I get just like through this next hour to this next appointment or to the next conversation? It's just tree to tree, right? And I I think there's, it's almost a fantasy that life could be anything else. Because that's all we actually are doing is tree to tree. And I mean, I feel feel like this is part of my issue with the like, just live in the present. And maybe this is me making excuses for myself and and my inability to do that. But I love having things to look forward to, right? That I, I think like one of the best things is being able to look back fondly and nostalgically on things of the past to be able to enjoy the embodiment of the present as more the aliveness of the present and to have things to look forward to. So I don't mean to say like, you know, everything is just tree to tree. And also that's the only thing that we're actually able to experience. I remember in 2019, I went out and did like a 700 ish mile section of the PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail, which is over 2,600 miles long. And because I started at the Southern Terminus, I was hiking around a lot of people who they were hoping to hike the entire trail, right? They were hoping to through hike, whereas I was out there, you know, to section hike. And it was interesting. There were some people that I met that when they found out that I wasn't trying to hike the whole trail, they were noticeably less interested in being friends with me or like making a connection. And it, w- it was at that point, I had enough hiking experience that I'm like, we're all section hiking until you make it to Canada, right? Like it's cute that you think that there's any difference between us, but like, we are literally hiking the same miles right now. We're dealing with the same water sources, the same windy conditions. Like there isn't, I hope for you, if you want to make it all the way that you are able to make it all the way, but like, we are all just going from tree to tree. Yes. (laughs) Right. It's so, it, it is interesting. This like I think we get caught into, we live in such a, um, power society, right. That 
it's very the the more the better the faster the stronger um the longer the further and it's like there is this almost hierarchy of uh goodness enoughness um right and i can i i'm sure that's true i'm sure that's always true of like oh you're just section hiking you're just doing these you know or day hiking Mm-hmm. right you're just out here for today like that's it's, it's it's funny when people are almost like apologetic to me where it's like well I'm just what I'm like literally do whatever you want I remember back when I was running and when I was doing half marathons and marathons and people would say oh I'm just running a 5k I'm like it's not do what do whatever it is that you want there doesn't have to be a hierarchy and can we own the enoughness of the choice that we made and just because someone out there is doing a more hardcore or a more extreme version of the thing that you're doing it actually doesn't mean that that's where we need to aim for i mean i think about this in in business and i've been self employed for over 10 years and i think and talk about money a lot i'm just fascinated with you know the psychology of money our relationship with money and more than anything i'm really interested in what enoughness looks like how much money is enough right? How much money is enough for me at various, you know, stages of my life as an anti-capitalist practice? Can I get out of this like exponential growth, always going for more and more and more? And it's, you know, I remember a time in the world of self-employment online business when having a six-figure business was the thing that all the business coaches were talking about, right? And now it's like a seven-figure business and an eight-figure business. Like at some point is enough enough, right? That's not, and I think that that applies to all of this too, being able to know, I think you use the word right size before. Like what is the right size challenge for where we are at, you know, any time in our life? What's the right size adventure? What's the right size amount of money, amount of friendships, amount of hours in the day to work. And that's going to change significantly depending upon if you had a kid six weeks ago versus if your mom just died, right. If you just got a promotion that it's like, we're not robots. We're on this, we're in this like ever changing flow of life or we're in the uh, kind of the flow of an ever-changing self, I guess I would say. And the right size adventure for one time is not going to be the right size adventure for another time. And I always try to get myself away from more hardcore is better. Yes. Yes. More hardcore. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Unless it means something to you, right? Right. And that could be completely arbitrary, right? We make it up. And that's, it's kind of fascinating to realize that our, um, I was talking with the last time I was out in Colorado hiking, I did, well, we were going to do four 14 ers in one day and we got snowed out and we kind of, we kind of were looking at it and it was like, this looks like it could be one of those stories and ways to get dead. So why don't we just do these two and head out? Um, but I was talking with a local there who was like, I'm over it. I don't do 14 ers anymore. I only do like 12 K maybe 12, five, whatever mountains. And I got to thinking about it and I was asking, I was like, what's up with that? Like, there's such a, I think there's like 58 14ers in Colorado and there's people who are like, you know, you want to do them all or, you know, there's this, like this trophy and the gold stars, like you talked about and this achievement that we're all so um, hooked into and, and people are impressed by it. And then one of, I mean, one of the first things people say, and I'm sure people ask you this too, oh, you did that 14er. What's the next one, right? (laughs) What's your next hike, Nicole? Like, I don't, maybe I'm done. Right. Yeah. There doesn't have to be more. There doesn't have to be right. And like, what I'm particularly interested in is the nuance of this, that like, I don't know, we're on this, you know, rock spinning in infinity. We have to find meaning somewhere that if hiking all of the 14 hours, if the project and the challenge of doing that makes you feel good, great. If, if baking a cake makes you feel good, great. Do that. That it's, it's, I feel like a lot of what I I'm always learning is this both and being able to hold the tensions and like, and for the most part, it's being able to, or being willing to be in an honest conversation with like an ongoing, honest conversation with myself about why I'm drawn to something It's sort of the idea of if the only reason I'm doing this is so I can brag about it on Instagram, maybe for someone that is a good enough reason for me, it was not you know? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, so something interesting, the hike that I'm leaving for in a week, I'm going back out to the PCT. I have 21 days off. I was able to rearrange my schedule in May so that I could have 21 days to hike. And I've always been interested in doing a hike that didn't have specific kind of geographic, this is, you're hiking from here to here. This is where you're done. I'm interested in, if I really push, 
how and things go well with my body, how far could I go? Right. Instead of setting up camp at 6 p.m., what if I went until 8 p.m.? Something that is more of that kind of hardcore athletic style that I've been curious about. We're yeah. coming off of winter. My fitness is meh at best. So we'll see if my body cooperates with this plan. But I'm just, I'm curious, not because I think that going faster is better, but because I wonder what will come up within myself. Like what new things will I be able to explore trying something that I haven't tried before? And with the Arizona Trail, because I was such a new hiker, I think my biggest motivation was setting out to do something that I 100% did not believe I could do. There was no part of me that thought that I could hike the Arizona trail, that I could finish the Arizona trail. I have a very clear memory and this is in the book, but I have a very clear memory of getting to my last resupply town in Patagonia and it was 750 miles in. So I had 50 miles left. And that was the first time that I actually believed that I was going to be able to finish the hike. And that has really stuck with me because I have always heard these messages of you have to believe in yourself first, or if, you know, if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to be able to achieve whatever fill in the blank. And I actually have not found that to be true because I hiked for 750 miles and did not believe at, you know, tree to tree. Yeah. I did not believe that I was going to be able to do it at all. And oftentimes I find that the belief is built in the doing. Yes. And that's why is that not okay? I, I, how are we going to believe in ourselves that we can do something that we've never done before? If we have not a one evidence, right. To support (laughs) that. If I waited until I believed that something was possible in order to do it, I would have never done most of, I would have never gotten sober. I would have never tried running. I would have never tried hiking. I, you know, all so many relationship things. And I don't remember what, how we got onto this tangent, but I love this idea that I don't have to believe in myself in order to just try. Yeah. And I, okay. This brings me way back to something that you said at the very beginning that I forgot about that this just reignited. And I, I feel like I'm just going to put an asterisk on this because I feel like it's super annoying to hear. And it's so true. It is truly who you become on the way there. And I know, I remember I've been doing yoga for like 25 years And there's all these like really sexy poses and you think it's going to be so fun if I can do a handstand or scorpion or the splits or fancy backbends or whatever. Turns out when you do a handstand, you're just upside down. (laughs) That's it, right? If you do the splits, like you're just closer to your really gross sweaty mat. That's nothing changes. And same, like you mentioned business, when you have a six figure business, when you have more than a six figure business, nothing changes. Right. And we think it's going to like, and we do this with everything, the new pair of boots, or if I have like the right shampoo, or if I, you know, could just get this client, or if I could do this pose, or if I could finish this hike or whatever we think this relationship, whatever we think that thing is, we're like, then I'll be set. And it, I don't know if you've noticed pretty much everybody who's listening to this, like you've lived long enough to know it's, it never works. It is truly who you become on the way there. And I forget somewhere in the book, you mentioned, um, kind of this, this moment of like, this is the hardest hike I'd ever done. Right. And I'm, I'm doing it like every day. It's the hardest hike I've ever done because I'm, I've never done this before. Mm -hmm. And you have, like you said, no shred of evidence. And I could feel in you, you're like, so I'm probably going to quit. You were totally on board with quitting. You were like, my dad's going to be there. It's going to be amazing. I'm out. Yeah, I feel really clean about it. Great. And you could have, like, mm-hmm. really, who cares either way? But it is, it's like the, who, like, we almost have no right to believe. And nothing is going to change. Nothing exciting or different is going to happen if we don't just do without the belief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I very much almost quit that hike for sure. That was something else. I think I was curious about was what would happen if I just kept not quitting. Yeah. And I think that can get put on a pedestal as well. This for idea sure. of make it to the end, no matter what achieve mm-hmm. your goals at all costs. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm not interested in that either. The year after 
the hike that's in the, this book, um, I went out to hike the whole PCT, or that's like what my intention was. And I quit a little past the halfway point. And I had been so public about this hike and I was kind of microblogging about it every single day. And so it was a really public quitting decision. Yeah. And that was so good for me. Yeah. And this realization that quitting can be the absolute kindest thing that you can do for yourself that I think so often what I want is to know that I'm okay, that I'm going to be okay, that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm not fucking up my life. And so what I'm reaching for is some kind of rubric or checklist that, well, if I do this, this, and this in this way, then I'm going to be safe. Then I'm going to be okay. Then I'm going to be loved. Then I'm going to have enough. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's a very, that's human, right? Like that is being human. And each time that I am shown, I always feel it's like so rude that that rubric does not exist, right? That in the instance you're talking about on the Arizona trail, quitting would have been the wrong decision for me. Yes. And the year later, quitting was absolutely the best, most loving thing that I could do for myself. And there's no, so there's no rubric. I can't say quitting bad. I can't say quitting good. It depends on the specifics of the situation. For some people going to marriage counseling for years and not getting divorced and choosing to stay, that is the right choice. For me, it was not. And so I think that Again, like I petulantly want to be like rude, right? Why is there not, a, where is the like grading sheet that you can give me so I can advance, get an A on all of my life decisions. And there's actually a lot of soothing freedom that I find when I can relax into the fact that there is no script I need to follow. And all I need to do is stay in that honest conversation with myself about what is needed in that time. And it's going to be different from time to time. Yes. Yes, we are complicated, sophisticated, contradictory beings, right? And it is, it's, you're exactly right. The quitting, and I even put that in quotes because it's like, you like, okay, on the PCT, how far, how many miles did you hike? 1600. <laughs> what have we really quit there, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, but I will tell you a really interesting thing that happened, Kelly, was so I, when I was talking publicly about quitting, right, one of the things that I said was that I had failed to meet my goal, right? That like the yeah, hike as okay. it was set out to be was a failure. And it was fascinating how quickly people wanted to rewrite that story for me, that they were like, oh my God, you didn't fail because, the, and I understand that comes from a good place, but I wasn't saying I'm a failure as a person because of this, but that people's reaction to the, the neutral factual statement that I had failed to do what I set out to do was so telling about what we culturally believe about failure, about quitting, about, you know, perseverance at all costs. And I'm like, that's fascinating that we want to have all these euphemisms for if we can't name, I wanted X and did not do X or did not get X. How are we ever going to allow ourselves to feel disappointment or grief? You know, I was so disappointed that that hike didn't go the way that I wanted it to go. And I wouldn't have been able to actually process those feelings if I was trying to sugarcoat it for myself. And there was something really profound in that too, that it's like, why is it, why is failing a problem? Yes. Yes. Right. I talk about this a lot too of the, and again, it's really baked into our society. It's really baked into our conditioning and just who we are as humans that success, good failure, bad. And I think, and I, I do this with almost all of my students is like, we need to redefine what success looks like in whatever element of their life we're talking about. And I want you to intentionally, not intentionally, I want you to welcome the failures that are going to come on your way to whatever your definition of success looks like, because you're gonna, if you're yeah. doing it right, meaning you're showing up, please fail right? That's part of it. It's like, I know this is kind of a dumb example, but it's true too. Like little kids learning to walk, they fail all the time until they can walk. Hell, we fail half the time. I mean, how many times have you like tripped over something this week, right? <laughs> That's part of it. Business-wise, right? How many times have you and I failed of like, I have this idea or this launch or this post or something, or this is going to be amazing. Everybody's going to love it. And it's like freaking crickets. 
you have to fail, fail, whatever, in order to get where you want to go. And it's always, always the path to it. It's never a problem. Well, it's like, what's the alternative that you only ever do things that you know for sure you're going to be able to do. And I will say I did that for a long time and it kept my life really small. Running was the first thing that I ever started and was terrible at and didn't quit. And that changed my life. Yeah. Sobriety has been an interesting one too, right? Because I, I mean, I'm, I'd be curious to hear more about your experience with this too, if you're game for sharing there was so much to relearn and to kind of fail at and to, to re like concerts, parties, conversations, mm-hmm. holidays with family, staying up past 8 PM that I was just like, I literally don't know sex. I literally don't know how to do this. If I'm not at least half obliterated, mm-hmm. I've never done it before. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you're learning things that you feel you should have learned. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, whatever the timeline is. And that can be really confronting and it can be really isolating. For sure. For sure. Like I pretty much failed my first sober concert. It was arcade fire. I had to leave like six or seven times. Cause I was like, guys, do you know it's really loud in there? There's so many lights. It's so stimulating and alcohol really helped kind of just numb all that and put a you know, a buffer between me and that experience. So it was like, I just had to fail at if I love concerts and mm-hmm. I had to fail at a few of them in order to like reacclimate to myself to what the real experience of that was yeah, like. And it, it takes the time that it takes. You know, I think sure, for sure me, does. one of the other tools that I employed in early sobriety was that I, I was so afraid that people would think that I wasn't fun anymore. Oh, because yeah. so many of my relationships, uh, probably almost all, if not all of my relationships were based around drinking together, or at least that was a key component of them. And so my strategy at the beginning that again, worked until it didn't was I'm going to, I'm just going to pretend that, that the act of drinking alcohol is something I can lift out of my life, but I'm still going to be the same person. I'm still going to go to all the same parties. I'm going to go to all the happy hours. I'm still going to be just as fun. And it was almost like a kind of chip on my shoulder. I have something to prove. You can't, it was, it was like a pretty aggressive approach for me that if you have a problem with it, that's too bad. I'm still going to do this anyway. And what I realized about six months in was I didn't even like those activities and, but it took (laughs) going to them and being so unwilling. Like if you had told me on day one of quitting drinking, all of the things that would have to change in my life or that would change in my life, I never would have done it because it was too scary. And I don't think that that's a problem of, you know, eventually a lot of those relationships phased out. Eventually I started doing other things with my time besides going to happy hour. And it was a more organic process. There was a lot of grief of a lost identity of this really fun party girl person that I saw myself to be. And it is quite possible that I'm less fun than I was then. And okay, cool, but I'm alive. So great, you know, um, but yeah, I think that's a lot of it. What it was for me was not even the unlearning or like having to relearn how to do those favorite things. It was realizing that I didn't like any of the things in my life pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So this kind of relates to hiking too. This is not a premeditated question at all. This is just one of those, like that's coming up off the top of my head because same. And I can remember those first few years when I had quit drinking people verbalizing and like bemoaning to me, oh, we miss fun, Kel. Do you remember how fun you were? Right. And (laughs) there's something that I've come to realize. It's been five and a half years. It'll be six years this year that I've um, been sober, that I'm really not that fun. There's a difference. I think, right. This kind of speaks again to that, like power, aggressive, more, more, more. You're never enough in our society. I think there's also this element of fun that's baked in like we should be having fun and fun looks like these certain brands and these certain kinds of like carefree again obliterated just no care like that that's a good brand of experience to have and i've really recognized that what i find deep enjoyment deep contentment and steadiness and it just 
I'm always telling my people I'm looking for a sense of just being deeply okay. <laughs> That's all I'm shooting for. I don't want to feel amazing or good or happy. I just want to be deeply okay. And the things that I love, reading, yoga, meditating, walking, hiking, they're kind of boring. <laughs> it's it, this yeah, this is a really interesting reflection because I would say same <laughs> in most of my life. Mm -hmm. And long distance hiking for me fulfills the craving for extremes. Yes. Because a lot of the time it is just boring. You know, you can't walk for eight to 12 hours a day and have a lot of it not be boring. This was, if we talk about like the, the gap between the fantasy of the thing and the reality of the thing, right. When I was just looking at, you know, long distance hiking pictures on Instagram and hadn't actually done it myself. The thing that really nobody talked about was how boring it can be to hike for that many hours a day. And, um, you know, that uh, some of what I wished people had been honest about, or from what I was looking at informed how I chose to tell stories about the trail and not leave that kind of stuff out. But I think that while that is true, the discomfort of it that we've talked about, the embodiment of it that we've talked about, it does create sort of the perfect storm of conditions for these peak experiences, like peak embodied experiences where, um, and maybe it's about such simple things, right? When you're so hot and tired and dirty and you find like the perfect cold swimming hole, a thing that, you know, in my everyday life, I could go run a cold shower right now. I don't want to get in a cold shower. It sounds terrible. Right. But in that moment where I'm like, God is real, there's a breeze right on a hot that I always am jokingly like a cool breeze on a hot climb is proof that God loves us and wants <laughs> us to be happy right that these things and it, whether it's because of the simplicity of being out there makes me more able to recognize and experience like and appreciate these things I'm sure that that's part of it but I think that for me it is almost an antidote to boredom because a lot of the things that I love and find contentment in are boring, so to speak. And that's totally fine and beautiful and enough. And I also want this other thing. And if I'm going to go and hike for 21 days or 800 miles or whatever, that is a much healthier for me way to achieve that sort of chaotic high feeling than being blackout drunk. So again, I'm not hiking yeah. because I, you know, we're coming next week will be my 12 year sober anniversary. I've been sober a long time. And so this doesn't at all feel like a replacement activity, but the, there were many reasons why I drank as much as I did. And one of those reasons was a craving for extreme feelings and experiences that kind of more, more, more thing. And just because I'm, I'm not getting it. I'm not scratching that itch in that way. doesn't make me not want that thing. And that's something else that I had wished that people were more honest about in early sobriety, that getting sober doesn't make me not want those like really big feelings and experiences. And I think some of that is what long distance hiking is for me. Yeah. I love that. Um, I was just thinking, okay, there's, there's a, have you heard about like the, like the window of tolerance that we have, right? Which like, if you think about this top line of like, if things get kind of activated, that fight or flight amped up kind of anxious energy, right? It's kind of like this top line and this bottom line of our window of tolerance is that more lethargic, more depressed, like um, hypo aroused, right? And in a lot of the work that I do, I'm, I'm talking about widening this window. For a lot of us, it's super, super, super narrow. And our world and our lives are built to throw us wildly out of what we can, what we have the capacity to just kind of roll with and, and flow with. And again, counterintuitively, I think the so-called boring things, they serve to kind of widen this window so that we don't have to ping pong in such a small space. but we do have those extremes and it's like, we feel it, it, it lands in a different way because it's not throwing us wildly out of what we can tolerate. That's the first time I put that in words. I don't know if that made a whole lot of sense. It definitely made sense. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something about finding some steadiness, but also building the resilience of, I don't have to have these high highs and low lows because I just can't tolerate anything, mm -hmm. right? I can tolerate a lot more. And because of that, the highs feel 
in a, in a sense that I just couldn't access and the lows do too. Yeah. Bummer, spoiler alert, but it, it's okay. Right. It becomes more deeply, again, more deeply. Okay. Yeah. And not such a problem. Um, okay. One more, one more. I had more, I had a whole bunch, but one more that we'll talk about. Um, and this is, This is the, so the podcast is called the Transforming Anxiety Podcast. We're all here thinking about looking for, looking to create a sense of shift and change in our lives, thought-wise, mentally, emotionally, in what we're doing, how we're speaking, how we're showing up, what we're creating, right? And, um, oh, I mentioned, I kind of referenced this earlier, but this is, um, you just talking about how how slow <laughs> change can be so this is you're getting much towards the end of the hike at this point um and you're saying something to somebody about how the organ section of the PCT is an infant baby joke hike compared to this is what you say you're like and in that moment as i typed it i realized just how far i've come because last year's hike, you're referencing the PCT, was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my entire not, entire life. But now look, which is just one more indication that change truly is possible. It's just that change and growth often happen so slowly that we don't notice we're getting stronger until we look behind us and realizes that we've realized that we've outlasted our old selves long enough to become our new selves. And given how lonely and painful these past 600 miles have been, it honestly surprises me to realize that my new self is such a total badass. <laughs> it We can only see some of it retrospectively, right? And then it's like, and again, we, we talked about this earlier of like, oh, if I sum it up in a minute and a half and I just tell you like this thing happened, right? I ran for four years. I quit drinking. I've hiked thousands of miles. We kind of make it simple seeming and the reality is that the the days the hours the minutes of change are are arduous right it's slow it's happening but it's slow Mm -hmm. Uh uh-huh yeah and you you often can't feel it in real time Mm -hmm. right it's as you are actively in the process of change or growth you know I feel like change doesn't always feel like change when it's happening. Growth doesn't always feel like growth when it's happening. And sometimes you do have to have those juxtaposition moments where you're like, oh, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, I would have reacted really differently to this situation. I guess I have grown in my boundaries, right? Or, you know, I can do so much more physically than I used to be able to do. Obviously that is a a growth point. There has to be some point of comparison. I feel like when we realize that, yeah, that we, that we were able to change. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I feel like we could have had two or seven other completely different conversations that would have been equally as amazing. Thank you so, so much for being here. Please, okay. Before we go, please tell everybody a little bit about the book. You, you're a writer, a hiker, a community builder, a podcaster. Just tell people where they can find you, where they can find out more. They can follow you and all your fun. I'm very findable on the internet. Um, (laughs) Yes. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I agree that there were seven different conversations that we could have had about this. And this is obviously the conversation we were supposed to have. So that's beautiful. Uh, Backpackingbooks.com is the website, both for this book and for the second adventure memoir about the Colorado trail that comes out in September. Uh, and you know, other things are linked on that website as well. I have a link to my current gear list. If people are, you know, nerdy about that kind of thing, I have a link to my hiking playlist, uh, the vibe for which obviously we all have different musical tastes, but the vibe for the playlist is you're standing at the base of a really big climb at the hottest part of the day. And you absolutely do not want to do it. And you have to do it. What's the song that you put on. So I think it's like two hours of music at this point. I keep adding to with every hike that I go on, I'm like, okay, what else needs to be on the hiking playlist? What did I learn on the last hike, right? About the vibe of the hiking playlist. So those things are all linked from there as well. And, you know, I, I write a weekly sub stack and other that you can find there. Everything is linked there. So that's probably the easiest place. Awesome. Awesome. And obviously I'll link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you again so much for being here. Your book was such a treat, especially because it's so Colorado wise, it's not 
quite hiking season yet. We have to get mm-hmm. to like the end of May, even beginning of June before we can get out there because of all the snow. Um, so I'm getting kind of itchy because I'm starting to plan out the summer's stuff. So this was like my perfect, like little escape and, and prep to read your book and just hang out with you on the AZT for the past few days. So well, I'm so glad that you felt that way. Uh, yeah, I, as, as evidenced by the fact that I'm like, what is the soonest that I can start hiking, right? Like the earliest in the year, where in the country can I go? That's not going to have big mountain snow. Uh, that's a very relatable feeling. I too tend to get really itchy come April. And I'm like, get me out there, get me out there. And yeah, so an adventurous summer awaits, hopefully. So good. So good. And Nicole is super fun to follow on Instagram. Um, she posts and shares just how things are going. And, um, this is going to go, this podcast will be out here just a few days after we're recording. Oh, okay, cool. This will be happening in real time. And so, well, yeah, in real time, then next week, I'm going on a hike, but if you are interested in following along on this, like truly unhinged attempt to try to essentially like PR my own hiking miles, considering I have not hiked more than six miles at a time since last August. And I think I'm going to do like 20 to 30 miles a day. It's, it is such an unhinged plan. I have enough experience (laughs) to know that what I'm doing is probably a mistake. And I'm like, am I going to fly all the way out to California? just to be injured in like two days, hopefully not. But I feel like if there's something that we want to try, it is worth giving it a try. And so I shall try. Yes. So follow along, find her on Instagram because it's such a treat. And it's just, it's just fun to, I think it's fun to, to, to follow you and see what you're up to. It also is fun to put your mind into the possibility, whatever that looks like for you, whether it's hiking or anything even remotely related to the outdoors, whatever hobby, whatever goal, whatever stretch change, new thing you want to create. It's fun to open your mind to what's possible for people and just watch somebody. I mean, you just said it. You're like, it's totally unhinged. Let's completely do unhinged things. Yeah. I mean, agreed, right? I feel like what I want is a life where, you know, the text messages with the close friends, where it starts with like, okay, this is a really wild idea, but, and then they're typing for a really long time, right? I'm like, that is the world that I want to be a part of. And so we'll see. This style of hike would have made a lot more sense in the late summer or early fall with a lot more hike training, but you know, I'm going to go now. It's going to happen now. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. The funniest thing, I know we like keep trying to wrap up and then we have other things to talk about. The funniest thing. So I have a one-way ticket to San Diego and then I have a friend who's driving me down to the Southern terminus of the PCT. And so then I'm going to go North from there for 21 days. I, on the 22nd day, I have a one-way ticket from LA. I live on the East coast. So one-way ticket from LAX back to Massachusetts but I have no idea where and how I'm getting to the airport. So like, that's another part of this adventure is I figure when I'm at day, like 17 or 18, I'll see where I'm at and then try to find a way to hitch to LAX or like find someone who wants to like drive me from the mountains to the, I don't know. So there's like many aspects of this plan that I'm like, woman, what are you doing? And I'm excited by it. And I'm like, that, that is the metric that I, so things don't always have to make sense. I know the difference between something that I'm doing because I think that I should do it. I can feel it in my body that like lit up excitement of the 20 tabs are open. And that's how I feel about this. And so I'm like, that's enough. It doesn't need to make any more sense than my body's like, cool, let's try. Yes. Yes. So it'll be happening. Like this will be be coming out. Nicole will be heading West. So follow along. And so if you maybe want to give me a ride to the airport (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. for all of our California, (laughs) LA people, (laughs) I can't, I I mean, we could have a whole podcast just about like funny hitchhiking stories and like things because that's how you get to town for on the lot of, for the trip to get from trail to town to resupply. A lot of it is hitchhiking or I've done the, like put up on Instagram. Does anyone want, and I've had really good luck with like lovely random people from Instagram, like meeting me and picking me up places. So I trust, I trust in the world. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Nicole, it was so, so much fun. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here.